Hello and welcome to episode 74 of ERRX and technically the first episode of season 3. I'm your host, Adis Carrick. The show is now in its third year, but it is still in its infancy. So thank you all for sticking with me as I learn how to be a good podcast host. And thank you for subscribing, for downloading, and for commenting on the episodes during the last two years. To kick off the third season, we're going to be discussing the management of hyperkalemia with a very special guest who really doesn't need much introduction. If you're a fan of pharmacy or medical podcasts, you've definitely heard of this guy. My guest graduated from the Presbyterian College with his PharmD degree and did his PGY-1 in Orlando, Florida at Advent Health and his PGY-2 in Atlanta, Georgia at Grady. Right now, he spends all of his time working in the ED in Atlanta, as well as the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. He is the founder and host of one of my favorites and one of the coolest pharmacy-related podcasts, the Farm So Hard podcast. He runs the Pharmacy and Acute Care University, or PACU, which you can find at pharmacy-acutecareuniversity.com, and he also has a third website, called Pharmacy Friday Pearls, which you can find at pharmacy-pearls.org. These are all fantastic educational resources, so make sure to check them out. I really don't know how he manages all of this along with a full-time job, but today he was generous enough to make some time for us to share just a tiny bit of his expertise. Please welcome my guest, Jimmy Pruitt. Thank you. Thank you so much for that phenomenal introduction. It's probably the best introduction I've ever had in my life. So (laughs) thank you, man. Jimmy, like I said, I don't know how you do all of this. And I'm convinced that the Roman numeral three behind your name just means that you cloned two other copies of yourself (laughs) and you're just the third one because there's no way a human being can do all of this in one lifetime. Just just trying to make sure I'm giving everything I have for the ED community, man. We just have such a great we, we just have, we are so blessed to just have the ED community as it is and to be able to practice in a setting that is such rewarding as, as we do. So I try my best to just give back everything I can when it comes to education and just giving the people what they ask for. And that's really all I do, man. Correct, man. Well, we are so happy to have you. Um, I was actually a guest on Jimmy's show back in uh, one of his episodes, episode 52. We talked about post intubation sedation. And we finally linked our calendars, and uh, today is is your time to shine on ERRX. So thank you again. And Jimmy, was there anything else you wanted to mention? Any any anything else that you have going on in your life right now? I just want to mention probably I I want to call it the biggest event in ED pharmacies, like you know, uh, conference history. We recently just had the Emergency Medicine Pharmacotherapy Resuscitation Conference, or other known as Empower. Uh, We had that on March 11th, and it was a phenomenal turnout. I'm to be very honest with you. I was expecting maybe, you know, 100 people, you know, maybe even 150 to show up, but to have, you know, over 700 people register for that conference and as as many people to be engaged, it was was just a phenomenal experience and super excited. And the great part about all this, guys, is that we've made it to where you can, uh, you can, you can access that at the, EmpowerRx slash conference.com. So all of the handouts, all of the videos are all there for free. If you are wanting to get CE, we're in, in a process now of getting home home study CE. So for people who want that, we can have it available. So uh, I've spent a significant amount of time working on that. I had a phenomenal team. So shout out to my uh, planning committee and shout out to everyone who, who actually came and gave input because the slogan of, of all that was a conference that was going to be for us and by us. And that was one of the big things. We had no administrators. We had no one who knew what they were doing. I would say I, I definitely <laughs> knew what I was doing. But we had all practicing pharmacists actually make this thing happen. So uh, if you guys have a chance, go check that out. It's, I, I want to say that's one of my my most prized you know, creations. And it, it, it'll be good for a community. Dude, that is awesome. I cannot wait. I'm going to check it out actually the instant that we end this interview. Um, so thanks for telling us all about that. So Jimmy, you know, I want to be really respectful of your time, of my listeners' time. So what do you say we just get right into it, man? Let's do it. All right. So to kick this off, you know, I just want to be clear and want to clear something up. When we talk about hyperkalemia in this episode, we're specifically talking about 
those hyperkalemic emergencies, right? We're not just talking about a slightly elevated potassium level. So Jimmy, can you tell us what signs and symptoms would alert us to treat an elevated potassium level emergently? I think the thing that we, we can get away with all of the, the weakness and the reflexes, those are all signs of just hyperkalemia in general. The thing that gets me, my eyebrows to raise quite a bit is when I see a patient, a history that matches up with them potentially retaining or not being able to excrete potassium. And the most important thing is the EKG findings. Um, and severe hyperkalemia may manifest with minimal or even atypical EKG findings. This is going to be including ST segment mod uh, mod modifications. You can have some pseudo Brigada syndrome. That could be a wide complex QRS. You can have some elevations of ST segment, J, J point elevations, T wave inversions, all of these things in addition to the traditional peak T waves, things of that nature. So, and the interesting part about all of this is that we get so comfortable with saying, oh, this only happens with very elevated potassiums. My, my research that I, that I conducted was able to find that 33% of my entire population of hundreds of patients had these, these symptoms less than 5.5. So this can happen in any, any range, but hyperkalemia in, it, in itself can be just what's needed for that patient. So the EKG changes are the big thing that's going to be associated with the things that actually make us want to act emergently. Understood, understood. And I think the on the flip side, the other interesting thing to me is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you can have a normal EKG um, that wouldn't exclude significant hyperkalemia, right? You get the EKG first, labs are pending, um, and then you get the potassium back and it's super elevated and you're like, well, wait, the EKG is normal, right? So yeah. it kind of goes goes both ways, correct? Yeah. And th that's the thing I think really shocks us a little bit is that we have to look at that potassium level itself and identify that as being, I have a potassium greater than six. That's bad. And then you also look at the fact that you have some EKG changes that's showing you from a cardiac standpoint, you're having symptoms of that because we have some patients that may be okay at six, all right, it may be okay at 6.2, but they, they just not necessarily have an EKG changes at that moment that you're checking them. So the interesting component is that only like 30, it's, it's anywhere between 30 and 40 percent, uh, the EKG itself is only 30 percent sensitive and actually detecting hyperkalemia. So you can't mm -hmm. use that by itself. But again, if you have a history, you have a lab and you have an EKG that's showing something, you can start to play a little bit. But again, it's very intriguing hyperkalemia in itself because again the first time you get this lab it may be false because the number one cause of hyper hyperkalemia is going to be pseudo hypernatremia due to hemolyzed labs so again you really have to be it, it, it's, it's intriguing uh, we can go down a rabbit hole but it's very intriguing uh, of all the things you have to consider when actually treating a patient for hyperkalemia correct i love it do you guys at any of your sites have like a specific level where you're pretty much like have to treat like is that level 6.3 6.5 or do you guys mostly look at previous potassiums, EKG changes, signs and symptoms, things like that? I would love to say that every time I'm involved in a case or I'm verifying a met that we, we consider everything. But I think the magic number, I would honestly say, I would say for my ED colleagues, because my, my medicine colleagues may have a different threshold, but six is usually that range. And the reason I think that happened is that, and we use Epic for our orders, or um, EMR, and it actually leads to a different uh, categorization of uh, elevated labs. So you have like the, oh, this is okay, alert, or you have like emergency. And at six, we get an emergency. And that's that just that symbol, I believe, is what causes my providers to you know, behave and be more aggressive in their treatment pattern. Got it. And as we segue into treatment, what agents do we use in the emergency department to treat hyperkalemia? And then we'll go down one on one and break down each of these agents. I think the best way that I've learned to to look at this is I I categorize it as cigars. Uh, and, and to be more specific, is cigar loops if I want to be all inclusive. But I'm talking about calcium. I'm talking about insulin with glucose. Also using albuterol, uh, your sodium bicarbonate, and your loop diuretics. So I go through I'll go through all of those, and then you can have your resins as well. So your C, your I, your G your A, your R for resins, and then your S for sodium bicarbonate, and then your potassium binder. So that's my little mnemonic mm -hmm. that helps me go through not only what agents, but the order for me and how I utilize those agents. So I, I think like it's that. pretty unique. 
I like that acronym, man. That's perfect. So starting with that C, that calcium. So let's take it back to the basics. Um, and I know you've described this before on your podcast, and I just thought it was a fantastic explanation. And now I want to hear it, and I want my listeners to hear it. So how does calcium work? I know we all say, well, it stabilizes the myocardium, right? But can you give us just a little bit more of a detailed answer? Yeah. And I want to, before I get into detail, I want to shout out my, my preceptor at Avid Health, Jim Priano, who like led me to down this path. This is the, the single question that changed my ED career. Because he asked me this and I, I was like, oh man, I got this one. He's not going to get me in this. And it's like stabilized blood membrane. He was like, how? And I remember my face just changed. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do as ED preceptors, right? Like you always ask the next, que next question, how, why, then what, <laughs> what if? <laughs> it's like so much. So I'm going to go on a very small tangent here because I think this is the one that's a little different. So before I go into calcium and just how, how exactly it works, we have to really break down what's happening in hyperkalemia in general so we can understand what's going on. And, and generally, there's, there's a few things that's happening. We have our resting potential that we traditionally have is going to be around negative 90 millivolts. And we have our threshold potential that's usually hanging out around negative uh, 65 millivolts. And that's in the average patient. That's the patient that is healthy, that does not have any issues. And some of the key elements that's going to be involved in that cardiac action potential is going to be your sodium, particularly in phase zero. Uh, and then you get into phase one, we have some your sodium and potassium channels as well. And then phase two of that action potential, you have your calcium that's going to be involved with some potassium as well. And then, and towards your phase three, that's where you're going to have your, your rectifier calcium, cal, calcium channels that's going to be open. So you have all of those things happen and they all work in unison. So if you disrupt any one of those, if you disrupt the inflow or outflow of sodium, calcium, or potassium, then you're going to disrupt or, you know, destabilize that cardiac myocardium and the active potential that's going to be associated with that. So overall, when you have an increased amount of potassium extracellularly, what you're going to do is you're going to prevent that sodium, that potassium from actually leaving. So again, you have a, a, a situation where hyperkalemia leads to a less negative resting potential. Let me get, I'm going to say that again. You have a less negative resting potential. So again, or more positive in, in, in a sense. So ultimately, your resting potential is closer to your threshold potential. And all that means, to me at least, because I'm not a, I'm not an electrophysiologist or anything like that, it just means that your 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 myocardium is a little bit more unstable because you have two things that are closer to each other, and that's going to lead to something bad happening potentially if we don't fix it rather quickly. And what calcium is going to do is going to it's going to hit that potent, that particular site and how it actually impacts the resting potential because it also impacts the threshold potential, but I'll get to that later on, is that when, you, when your resting potential is impacted, that's going to lead to sodium channels being uh, blocked. So again, resting potentials is going to be uh, disrupted by the potassium, not being able to leave the, leave the cell. That buildup is going to lead to you having an uh, increase in your resting potential. That increase in your resting potential actually leads to a decrease in your velocity or Vmax of phase zero. All of that to say that your sodium channel, in particular, the NAV 1.5 channel being disrupted, and that's going to cause some major issues across the board. And what calcium does is actually binds to a calcium-dependent calmodulin and a protein kinase receptor. And what that does, it just activates that, that sodium voltage-gated channel leading to intracellular sodium into the cell. And I think one thing that can really help us bring this home is that we all know for our TCA overdoses or anything with a wide complex arrhythmia, we give sodium bicarbonate, particularly for that sodium component. So all we're doing is finding a different way to introduce sodium into that sodium channel that leads to the closure of that wide complex arrhythmia. So that's going to be one of the big things that, that we, we utilize and it's super complex, but I think it's simple. Once you look at it, all we're doing is opening that sodium channel, driving more sodium in, and closing that QRS interval, and making our our resting potential uh, more again, more negative again. So it's actually widen that gap between the threshold potential and the resting potential. The other cool part is that 
1955, they did a study and showed that more depolarization was required in calcium-rich solutions. So ultimately, what those authors that are much smarter than me, they said that the resting potential was unchanged in their study, but the threshold potential had increased. And they concluded that this accounted for the stabilization effect of calcium. So we have this, we have two things happening here potentially. We think we know what's happening, but it may be a little bit of both, where we're basically just, it's this gap between the rest of potential and the threshold potential. And we may be moving them in the right direction for them to have a more stable myocardium. So if your rest of potential gets closer to the threshold potential, According to this 1955 data, we can just inc- we can just increase that threshold potential and widen that gap. And some other studies looking at that sodium channel that's going to be disrupted, that's going to be associated with the, the resting potential. We can make that more negative again, opening that gap between the two. And again, just making those two resting potential and threshold potential further away from each other. That's going to stabilize the cardiac membrane, and that's going to make it so your patient doesn't code on you. <laughs> Long explanation, but again. Pretty cool once you get into a rabbit hole. Yeah, Tony much Blue needed. Tutorial on it, and it's phenomenal. I'll have to check that out. And by the way, any student or resident I ask that doesn't give me that answer is going to fail the rotation. Yeah, like that, if that, I just hear and you know stabilizes the myocardium, I'll be like, oh, you got to listen to Jimmy Pruitt, man. That answer <laughs> is not good enough. <laughs> if any preceptors out there, if you actually if you actually students your residents that and their eyes doesn't pop out of their head once you ask them how. <laughs> it's one of the most phenomenal things in the world. <laughs> well, I just love the mechanisms of actions of drugs and, you know, and I'm assuming like calcium, like most of the things we've discovered, it was probably by accident, right? They probably just gave some calcium. They're like, oh, hey, this worked. And then you kind of later discover the mechanism of it, right? Absolutely. Um, so I'm assuming this is what happened with calcium. I can't be absolutely sure, but it seems like one of those things that's way too complicated for somebody in the 50s to have figured out. <laughs> Yeah, and especially with like just with just myocardiocytes just like sitting there in calcium rich solutions, like oh, I spilt this, <laughs> and I noticed how when I shocked it, it didn't do as much as when it what didn't have the calcium. So it had to be happen, man. <laughs> so this is a very complex like mechanism of action. So realistically, how quickly after you give calcium should you see some results in terms of EKG correction? Absolutely, man. The great thing about this, you're gonna see it pretty rapidly. Uh, there's been times again when I'm fortunate to work in states where pharmacists are allowed to administer medication. So I would give this medication and I would see a rapid improvement within minutes. I would see that. And if I don't see that improvement, then I'm like, uh, okay, this is, this is challenging. I have to try something else. But again, you should see these results rather quickly. And it's, and it's also cool to think about we're giving this during cardiac arrest when we're correcting our H's and T's, you should see an impact if this is the, the case within a minute. So this is something that is pretty rapid that occurs. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. And how long does the effect last? I guess another way of asking that is when you're pushing this drug at bedside, how often do you repeat a dose if needed? And that's the thing. You Usually, again, if you want to go to LexiComp, and I know everyone, you know, I, I have a very... In, a quote that I would say, don't be a LexiCount pharmacist. But if you're being a LexiCount pharmacist, you're just looking at exactly what the textbook says. We're talking about anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes of actually having an effect. And that's when it really depends on the situation and how severe the case is. I may be redosing this uh, every 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the patient. And if I gave anything to remove the potassium, like a potassium binder if they're going to dialysis or a loop diuretic. So if I, if I can't remove it and that, and that potassium is necessarily getting shifted back out, or I just don't have a way to get rid of the potassium, I'm going to repeat this if I have EKG changes reoccur. Correct. And, you know, I once was working in the ED and a nephrologist ordered calcium gluconate one gram every 30 minutes until dialysis. <laughs> that happened. I promise you that. That's definitely an ED order, man. I clicked verify. I was like, yep, you know what? I don't know. Like you said, what the max, max dose is. Um, he was going to dialysis in a couple hours anyway, so it wouldn't have been like 18 doses or anything. But uh, I was like, I love this. Let's do it. This sounds great. <laughs> and you brought up a good point. One of the things that my, my nurse's staff like got angry at me because they knew we wasn't going for like three or four hours. So I, I spoke to the nephrologist and said, hey, 
how about I just put this in a drip and let this run over that period of time and I can just give you a rate of one gram every 30 minutes or one gram every oh, I hour. That. Let's put it in a drip and you guys may not have access to it in your hyperkalemia order sac, but you may have it in your, your hypo, hypocalcemia of like malignancy order mm -hmm. sac. So mm -hmm. you may have a different way that you can order a, a calcium gluconate drip or it's just different ways you can find a way to order it. But I've done that a few times and it just saved me from being at the bedside or saved my nurse from being at the bedside for hours. And I knew I would put anywhere from you know three to four grams or five grams in a, in a in a liter bag if they were not necessarily dialysis. I can put it in a smaller volume, but run that over a period of time. So I didn't have to do that every 30 minutes or an hour, but it's just so many different kinks and nicks you, you can do. Oh, I love that. See, this is the stuff I live for and and why I started podcasting and listening to other podcasts is these little, these little tips and tricks, right? That make life so much easier. I have never done that, Jimmy, but uh, in the future, I definitely will. <laughs> it's keeping the back of your head, man. It's just like, I know it's like, I don't want to give every 30 minutes, but like, how can I find a way to make this easier? And I thought about it. It's like, oh, they have a hypocalcemia order set. I'm like, let me just try this and see what happens. <laughs> yes. It works beautifully. Oh, that's perfect. And just, I just want to hit on one more thing when we talk about calcium, and that is what salt do we use and why we have the chloride and the gluconate. Uh, what do you see used and in which scenarios would you choose one over the other? Yeah, and, and this is rather interesting right now because of the shortage that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say it's calcium gluconate for me, and it depends on a few things. It depends on the access that I have, and it depends on the situation. I, I like to say that sometimes as a pharmacist, half your job is treating the patient, and the other half is treating your team. So sometimes calcium is ordered for a potassium of 5.5 5.4. The patient is completely fine. and it's just something they're ordering with no EKG changes. Those patients, I'm completely fine giving calcium gluconate and giving it through an 18 gauge or a 20 gauge IV and they're completely fine. In the patient that's period rest, I'm nervous, my attending is nervous, there's a lot of things going on, That's or, it is, or it's actually cardiac arrest. That's when I prefer calcium chloride. Um, I don't have studies to support this, guys, so I'm not going to play around the bush. I'm going to tell you what I use and what's worked well for me. I've had a patient, again, Brittian down, blood pressure's getting low. I push some calcium. The patient, you know, bounced back rather quickly. I gave the rest of the drugs and the, and the patient did fine. Um, I have not had many issues when it comes to extravasation or, you know, calcium deposits on tissues or having any necrosis, things of that nature, looking, looking back. So I feel okay in pericardic arrest being able to give this calcium chloride uh, as preferred compared to my calcium gluconate in patients that are, they have some changes, but they're not necessarily very sick. My provider's not too worried. My nursing staff feels comfortable giving the calcium gluconate. And, and if I have it actually available, because right now I don't have calcium gluconate available. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, these drug shortages are really, really killing us, aren't they? <laughs> All right, so switching gears uh, from calcium, uh, your next uh, letters are I and G, right? So insulin and I guess glucose or dextrose. So do you want to just run through how insulin works and why we give it with dextrose? Yeah, and, and these all the rest of these agents, they all work similarly but differently. So the cool thing about insulin is that, of course, it's going to bind to the insulin receptor on a skeletal skeletal muscle, and this is going to actually activate the sodium potassium ATPase. What that's going to do is lead to potassium transfer from the extracellular to the intracellular. And the cool part is this, when you start looking at this, um, it's basically going to lead to where you're going to start exchanging uh, three sodiums uh, from intracellular to extracellular, and then two potass potassium is going to go intracellular. So that's going to be the pump that's going to work that way. It's just intriguing. Again, we're not necessarily saying that insulin binds directly to that receptor. We're saying that the, the insulin binds to its own insulin receptor, and then that's going to cause a promotion of the upregulation of that potassium, that sodium, the sodium potassium ATPase. So that's one thing that occurs. And the cool thing, we talk about glucose or, or dextrose, it's two things that we're using it for. The interesting component is that exogenous glucose actually stimulates insulin secretion 
that then goes and binds to the insulin receptor that then goes and upregulates and activates that sodium potassium ATPase. And it's also going to prevent the hypoglycemia that can be associated with that in, in some of these patients. And I've talked extensively about insulin doses and how to prevent hyperglycemia. But again, just in general, that sodium potassium ATPase is, the, is, is golden when it comes to uh, the transcellular shift of potassium. That is a perfect explanation. And here's a question that I had actually asked a few residents, and it's about 50-50 on if they get it right or wrong. Um, in the setting of somebody who's hypoglycemic, can you just give dextrose, knowing what we know now after your explanation of, you know, the dextrose or glucose causes your endogenous release of insulin, could you just give dextrose and withhold the insulin if somebody is actually in a hyperkalemic emergency? Now, this, this is the thing, and I would say, I will answer this in an academic setting. Academically, yeah. Clinically, I won't be able to get that passing. <laughs> no. Like clinically, cl clinically, no. I would never be able to convince my doctor, hey, they, they, they make enough. And the one thing we also have to re remember, I guess for me, when I think about this question, is this patient already producing, a, like why isn't they producing enough insulin in general? So like, it's a few different things I, I look at, but clinically, no, it would never fly. And even, mm -hmm. you know, I would like to, but academically, depending on the patient in the entire situation, it makes sense that you can be able to do that. Um, but again, I haven't found a significant amount of data. You're, you're probably bigger on that than me, but it's, it's something that's actually intriguing from an academic standpoint. It is. It's like, I mean, you can philosophize on it all day. Uh, again, I would never do it because um, I'm worried that the insulin released is probably very variable depending on your patient. And it's probably... I'm assuming lower than, you know, regular insulin, 10 units straight into the IV. Yeah, um, huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. Um, I guess I would be very confident in never doing it um, and just giving more dextrose, right, or glucose um, to kind of counteract that effect of the insulin. Um, and so I kind of, you know, kind of jumped ahead of this question. But my next question is, what form of insulin do we use and what route do we use? This is an, another interesting question because the more you look into these things, you realize there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So regular insulin is the most commonly used uh, insulin and given it intravenously is the most commonly uh, form. Uh, but when you start looking, looking back at this, the only thing I can just, again, academically get to is that when given an IV, you have that huge increase and the concentrations of insulin that's going to be able to saturate those receptors rather quickly. And for me, it would take a significant amount of time to activate that sodium potassium ATPase when given sub Q when I want something to work now. Um, I'm not wanting to wait, you know, two to four hours for it, its peak. I want something to work a little sooner. And that's the only way I can just academically think about this. But again, I'm pretty sure someone out there can actually look at this. And I did a brief re review earlier couldn't find too much. But again, I'm pretty sure there could be a, a appreciable amount of potassium reduction when given it sub-Q. But I think the key thing that, that matters to me is the, the kinetics of that, along with everything else that I'm doing. But again, I, I'm interested to hear your approach on this. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. So we give the 10 units of IV regular insulin. Um, I've, I've actually looked into this and there's really nothing out there, like you had said, my my hunch, uh, even though we're giving a rapid acting insulin sub Q, so you would you would think that it would work, you know, because you can use an aspart or something versus a regular. My first thought is it's potentially like inconsistent bioavailability, right? So uh, giving it sub Q might not work as well in certain patients. And then yeah, B like how quickly are you getting to that peak level um, when you give it sub Q versus IV? And then I think about diabetics and when we just treat hyperglycemia, and I think about giving 10, 20-ish units of rapid-acting sub-Q insulin, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody get like hypokalemic from it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm like, I don't think I've ever seen just like sub-Q insulin reduce somebody's potassium level. So there's got to be something to it mechanistically where it just doesn't do it as much. Yeah. And I think it's just that concentration that you're getting very quickly. And like, I always think about dopamine is like my, one of my in, most interesting pressures. You think at a certain dosage, you get a different effect. And ever since I've like 
thought about dopamine, it makes you think about different agents. Same thing with epi. It's like you get certain effects at different different concentrations. And mm-hmm. maybe at this concentration that we're giving IV, that very quick peak, we're actually activating some different receptors as well. So uh, I'm definitely intrigued by it. If you guys are listening and you've done a study on this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. If you're listening, please comment, send us an email, do whatever you got to do. Make us look foolish. I don't care. Give us a good reason as to why sub-Q doesn't work. Because yeah, I've not seen a potassium drop when just giving some sub-Q insulin. So. <laughs> so speaking of that, how much can we expect the potassium to decrease when giving 10 units or even five units, as we'll talk about later, of IV regular insulin? That's the great part. You know, it's going to work within 20 to 30 minutes and lasts about three to six hours, depending on what studies you look at. But you're going to see a decrease anywhere from 0.5 to a little over one milliequipment per, per, per liter or millimoles per liter, whatever your units you want to use. But the intriguing fact, when we look at the data and go back, it's, it's a lot of confounders in there because most of the time we're not just given insulin. I was using a combination with a few other things and the data is not as robust as most people would like it to, to be, mm-hmm. to be honest. But <laughs> again, around that one milliequipment per, per liter is going to be uh, what I see when given given doses in patients that have a higher level. Uh, I'm talking in the sixes, but those patients are on the lower end, of fives to 5.5s. Uh, you can see a little lower in, the, in that 0.5 milliequipment range. Yeah, and which is pretty significant, right? Uh, like yeah. a one milliequivalent per liter is, is, is a lot. Um, and then do you ever redose um, IV insulin? That's something that's been, it's actually been coming up a little bit more often lately because, again, just not being able to get these patients to the dialysis in a, in, a, in a rapid fashion. If I actually had a patient today, today I had a patient that was coming up on four hours post-insulin dose. I didn't see any orders for the dialysis uh, order set. And I was, I went over to my doc and said, Hey, I'm just putting this in your ear now. If you don't hear from nephro, if you don't hear from the actual dialysis nurse in 30 minutes, I may consider redosing because what I don't want to happen in a busy ER is that that patient hangs out down there for an additional four, four or five hours. And just the nature of being a busy hospital, that patient doesn't go to dialysis. We have that translator shift outwards back now and we represent with these symptoms again and we're trying to do all these things over so i try to keep myself ahead um, I, I repeat anywhere from three to six hours especially again if i don't have dialysis now if i have a patient that is able to urinate a significant amount of urination as well um, i'm less aggressive or if i have a patient that i know is like headed off to dialysis in a, like in 10 minutes i'm not as as, as aggressive but Again, EKG changes reappear, or I, I get a I, I get a, a a stat potassium level that's increasing. That's what I'm gonna redose. But again, three to six hours my range, and this again is for my patients that I don't have a game plan within an hour or so after that in four hour range to re- remove the potassium. I love it. I love it, man. And we all think about you know redosing calcium and getting all cowboyish with it, but you know we forget, you know, myself included that um, in a world where we have a lot of borders in the ED, you know, not a lot of beds, patients are hanging on the ED for hours, if not days, um, pay attention to when you actually shift somebody with insulin um, and know that you can redose it uh, if needed. And I think that's probably more overlooked than we think. Absolutely. And another thing that's probably overlooked is if, if you're getting a patient from a facility, from dialysis or from somewhere else, check to see if they gave insulin. Sometimes patients can, I've had a patient recently that came from a facility and they gave him insulin IV, but it was nowhere documented on my MAR and my time was based off that one. And I was like, asked my docs, hey, what happened? He's like, oh no, the actual facility gave him that. So you have to check the notes sometimes to do a little digging to make sure that way you're not double dosing these patients that are already on a verge of hypoglycemia, especially if we're using the 10 dose as a, a lot of shops are still doing. Correct. And that's a perfect segue of, you know, how much insulin do we give? And you had on your podcast, episode 47, you talked about giving somebody five units versus 10 units. And quickly, what were the results that they saw, if you remember, in that study? And when you talked about this, and and what do you guys do at your site? Yeah, and this has been great, because we've made some big changes. So overall, there's about four or five studies now that's come out comparing either 
it, it, most of the studies look, look at five versus 10, but some of them, they categorize as, as less than 10 versus greater than or equal to 10. And across the board, what I tr traditionally see, I would say 90% of the studies is that I see a major reduction anywhere from 20 to like 50% reduction of the, of the incidence of hypoglycemia, but I don't see any difference in the, in the reduction of potassium. They have similar decreases. Or if there is a statistical significantly uh, difference, I'm talking 1.1 milliliters per liter compared to uh, 0 0.97, uh, that's a statistical significant difference. Clinically, to me, that doesn't matter. Um, I'm just gonna be honest. I don't think that's gonna matter as much, especially when I have other agents that I'm doing. So across the board, what I'm noticing is that for one, the insulin 10 unit dose came out of nowhere. I, I, I can't find where that came from. It's probably some rat data in 1800s. <laughs> <I'm just joking. laughs> but we just, we just made up that. Yeah. And now, you know, weight-based dosing at 0 0.1 unit per kilo, maybe a, a deal is the classic five in my shop. Uh, shout out to my partner, Kelsey Billups. We actually changed our order set. The standard for all patients is five out the gate. Ooh, uh, nice. All right. So everyone's going to get five in the ED. And then from there, we, we can continue to, to, to use other agents as well. But what, we're going to go back and look and see a pre-post to see, do we see a major difference in hypoglycemia? Um, I anecdotally haven't had many issues in patients that just got five. But the problem that happens is this. We have to watch out for this as pharmacists. Your ED group or your just your one team of order five, someone will see that and go to up to date and say, oh, <laughs> gosh, they gave the wrong dose. The pharmacist is an idiot and give 10 or give five more and don't necessarily give more dextrose in that patient's blood sugar is 30. So Correct. that's Correct. something that I've seen. If there's issues with hypoglycemia, the issue that I see is usually that someone order a second dose that wasn't necessarily needed from a hyper hyperkalemia standpoint, but we wanted to make sure that we satisfied the gods of up to date. You know, and that for everyone listening is very important. Not only what you said about satisfying up to date, but also the hypoglycemia. And when you talked about your order panel, so when you're giving that five units of insulin, you know, we talked a lot about insulin and we talked a little bit about the dextrose. So how much grams of dextrose are you giving with that five unit dose of insulin at your sites? Yeah. So right now I'm giving 25 grams and fortunately we're, we're using D10 right now because I don't have the 50 syringes and I'm not yep. upset about that, to be honest. And I, I can probably use a little less, um, but that's what our order said is using the 20 to 25 grams. 25. Um, and that's for your standard patient. Um, for your patients that are a little bit, again, ours, ours cap out at less than less than 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter, you're going to get, they're going to get 50 grams. And then those patients that are above 200, I'm very cautious with this because those that are on the cusp of like 201, they get, they get nothing. They don't have to. Most of the time, my docs are going to check that anyway. But again, we range it to where if you're less than 100, you can get 50. If you're between that 100 to 200, you can get you can get 25 grams. And if you're above that, you don't have to get anything, but you still have to PRN order set in case that blood sugar does drop down um, hours after. Because I remember talking to a doc and he was like, oh, Jimmy, I'm just going to give double the dose of, of dextrose and give 10 units. And I said, but the kinetics doesn't plan out. He's like, what do you mean? I said, the dextrose is going to be metabolized if you go from 30 minutes to an hour. I said, your insulin in a patient that has any kind of renal dysfunction can hang out for eight hours. It can hang out anywhere from six to eight hours. So it doesn't really pan out. I remember seeing his face go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many different ways to do this. And I think more sites are moving to giving less. Uh, for example, my site, you know, we used to do the 10 units IV for everyone back a few years ago. And then we developed this hyperkalemia order panel or order set and if you guys out there listening don't have one of these in your ED, I think it's crucial that you get an order set with all of these meds. But what we do is we do the 0.1 units per kilo, I think Jimmy was talking about, um, with a max of 10 units. And then we either give 25 grams or 50 grams of, of dextrose, depending on their blood sugar level and their creatinine clearance, right? So people that are more hypoglycemic, 
or maybe you have worse kidney function, we'll get 50 grams versus 25 grams. And then as a safeguard, again, Jimmy touched on this a little bit, we um, actually changed our PRN dextrose order to be an actual scheduled order. So every 30 minutes, it alerts the nurse to give dextrose. And of course, they can chart, you know, not chart it or not necessary if the sugar is at an appropriate level. But if they start to drift down, the nurse will be prompted to give a dose of dextrose. Um, and so we have these Q30 minute dextrose orders that go for two hours. Um, but listening to Jimmy and, and kind of doing some more research, I think we should maybe one day talk about just giving five units to everyone, especially if you're not seeing a greater potassium decrease with the higher dose. It just doesn't really make much sense. We just like to make up doses and, you know, hey, that's what that's what we, that's what we do. And <laughs> that's our, our job now is to dispel most of that. Yep, exactly. All right, so shifting gears. So cigar, what are we on now? We did IG. What's A again? We got albuterol. That's going to come Albuterol. All right, let's, let's jump to albuterol. Um, so what does albuterol do and how much will it lower your potassium? Yeah, so the great thing about albuterol is that it's going to work very similarly. So it's going to actually cause an upregulation of that sodium potassium ATPase in the skeletal muscle, but it's going to actually have a, a distinct pathway than that from, from insulin. So it's actually going to, you're going to go through your beta receptor and that's going to also cause an upregulation. But again, it's not the same thing, but this, it's the same end result of having that. You can have a reduction. Again, this one's a little different because again, when you go back and look at the data, most of it from the 90s, and a, a significant amount of it is with IV albuterol, but the data is going to actually say salbuterol. But again, the same compound, but again, when you're looking at the data and converting from uh, you know US to European to different different agents, we're talking about the same compound, but it's going to be looking at very differently. And I, we can see anywhere, again, from a, a 0 0.5 to about 0 0.9 consistently, but again, Again, I just range it from 0 0.5 to 1 milligram, but again, another significant reduction in, pota in, in potassium. All right. So we got A taken care of. Now we're going to just rip through the rest of these. Uh, so what, what is R? So R is going to be resins. And I know I cheated there by, by, by talking about all of our potassium, potassium binders. And they're very controversial. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. I've had... I've had a very interesting view when looking at the class in general. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I have a different approach now. Mm -hmm. What is that approach? So when, when looking at all these things, of course, let's just talk about just the class in general. We have pteromere, we have sodium zirconium, uh, which is going to be brand name Lokelma, and we have our sodium polystyrene sulfate, aka just your your Ooh. classic. You know, the one that must not be named. You're your KX late, <laughs> like get KX late. That's why I make, sure I, I make sure I put the X in there for sure. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to be very brief here. Overall, I'm not a fan of the, the classic uh, sodium polystyrene or KX late. However, I'm more of a fan of the sodium zirconium and pteromere, and they're growing on maybe, but I think they have a very unique role. So, very briefly, what these agents do is they're going to bind and exchange either sodium or hydrogen or a different compound for potassium and excrete that in the GI and you're gonna, it's going to come out as a very powerful laxative. So your nursing staff may hate you <laughs> if you actually ask them to do this. Um, the data now is very controversial when it comes to sodium polystyrene or cakeslip. I don't think it works, guys. I think it takes anywhere from 12 to 24 hours to work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say that my RPD and his colleagues had a paper come out saying that it does work in their population, but I'm, I'm looking, looking at this as monotherapy. I don't think it's a phenomenal agent. There is a that, that very small, I'm going to be honest, very small chance of that bowel necrosis that can occur when using this. But now let's consider the fact that we now have other agents. Uh, Pteromir has uh, reported, again, to have an onset anywhere from two to seven hours, which is significant to me. Uh, if, it, if it does anything and it works within two to seven hours, that's fine. And there's a small pilot study, again, very small, said that it, it reduced potassium within two hours. Again, but the effectiveness overall when looking at all the other agents we're talking about, again, 
it's, it's still controversial and how much it reduces down. Um, sodium zirconium, which has really been getting most of the love. So Lokelma is getting most of the love, I would say. Mm-hmm. It's 10 milligram dose here has been shown to reduce potassium by 0.1 milligrams within one hour. And again, by 0.7 by 48 hours compared to placebo. Um, I'm again, that's not a big thing to me, to be mm-hmm. honest. However, it seems to be relatively safe. Nephro thinks it's like oh the best thing since sliced bread. The they, best thing. If you whisper <laughs> Lokelma, a nephrologist may appear. <laughs> so one hundred percent. I'm 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 not a hater of these other newer agents right now. Um, yeah, they may do something. Mm-hmm. Your patient will crap. Um, <laughs> and and take some potassium with them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I, I'm not. I don't think they are. I don't think by themselves they should be ordered. I think that if you're waiting, the unique role that I mentioned before. I think that these agents are best for your patient that is not acutely sick, no EKG changes, so they're not sick enough for emergent dialysis, but they have high enough levels to go to dialysis. And they may take six hours. They may take they may take eight hours. This is the patient in between you consulting nephro and them going to dialysis. I think these are the patients that that deserves to have their bowels cleanse <laughs> <laughs> these potassium binders. So I think that's the unique role for these. Got patients. it. So basically, like a a bridge to dialysis Absolutely. if dialysis is delayed, which Absolutely. makes total sense. And. Just to go back to KXLate a little bit for those younger, younger kiddos listening that may not know the history of KXLate or sodium polystyrene sulfonate. It is, you know, not recommended anymore, had minimal reductions in potassium, like again, less than one. And that was even over like one to seven days of continued treatment. And to make it even more awesome. It was associated with intestinal necrosis and high rates of mortality, um, and it contained 1,500 uh, milligrams of sodium for each 15-gram dose. So we actually got rid of k on our formulary. You can't even order it anymore. Yeah, it just, it's just not something we probably should use. And yeah, I, I won't go too deep into it. It's just not a phenomenal agent. I think it's trash. I don't. I, I don't want to bring that that language to your podcast. I like to call <laughs> a lot of things trash. Oh, we'll um, get there. <laughs> but I, 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 I categorize the the sodium polystyrene sulfate in in that uh, trash can group. I love the trash can. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So where are we at? We right, did so R. We are on S. Yeah, we're on S now. And what is S? I'm going to be very. Uh, is this sodium bicarb? <laughs> is this is this sodium bicarb? Listen, anyone who knows me knows <laughs> that I have a significant beef with the way that we use bicarb. I love it, man. So Jimmy has three an amazing series called Beef with Bicarb. Uh, episode thirty one, he talked about its use in hyperkalemia, which is what I'm focused on today. Episode 34, he again discussed its use in the setting of DKA. And then episode 38, you talked about this in its use in cardiac arrest. And I enjoyed all of those episodes because I am also in the same group of uh, not really being a huge fan of bicarb, if not used correctly. So, man, I know you love to talk about bicarb. So why don't you tell us, in theory, (laughs) what it's supposed to do, um, how and how it's supposed to work, and then Tell us your thoughts about if it works or not. So again, on paper, the LexiCump pharmacist in me would say that sodium bicarbonate promotes the uptake of potassium into skeletal muscle by increasing intracellular sodium via the sodium bicarbonate co-transport and the sodium hydrogen exchange and in turn increases the sodium potassium ATPase activity. Again, we're always getting back to that sodium potassium ATPase. Mm-hmm. It also works in a few different ways as well. So that's like the main transcellular shift part of it. It's also going to work in the kidneys as well. So potassium channels in the dif- distal nephron are downregulated by acidosis, but they're upregulated by alkalosis. So in theory, you give bicarb, which is an alkalizing agent, it causes potassium channel upregulation, and that's going to lead to an increased excretion of potassium. And then lastly, just a dilutional effect. If you give a liter of fluid, 
and you have a, a, a amount of potassium in that that deciliter by increasing the volume in that you're gonna have a less vo- you're gonna have less potassium in that deciliter. Just give them like eight liters of fluid. <laughs> like just like if you but again the problem is this: most of your patients are again my my data says a little bit over half of my patients are gonna be in in stage or recently uh, going to in stage that di- have to get, receive dialysis. So most of your patients, you won't be necessarily able to give a large volume to. My beef is this. The data, the data, the data is trash. Now, when I say trash, I'm going to be very brief here, guys. If, you're, if we're, we're making all this hypothesis on animal studies and, and, and observational studies with people, with the biggest one I have here is 18 patients, we're, we're, we're not going to really show much benefit here. Um, the issue is that we give sodium bicarbonate here in its hypertonic form. Nephrologists out there and some palm crit people like to argue with me, and I don't mind. And they tell me that the hypertonic version, the 8.4 amp that we give, is actually beneficial if their pH is less than you know 6.9 or 7.2, whatever, whatever they want to make up for that day and <laughs> say that it's going to be used for in those patients. I, I don't necessarily think it's going to be a it's going to work. Again, I'm talking hyperkalemia in isolation. Because if there's some other issues going on that bicarb may be beneficial for, for preventing AKI and preventing people getting on, on, on dialysis, bicarb ICU all day. Do your thing. But bicarb ICU is an infusion. <laughs> so if you tell me that bicarb works as, in, as, a, as a push, I'm going to tell you it, it, it doesn't. And this is the reason. If you give it as a push in a 50 ml bolus, you're only given a super concentrated version of sodium. Um, that's going to work great for EKG changes because you're going to be able to overcome that NAV 1.5 uh, channel blockade by hyperkalemia, but it's not going to do anything. And this is the thing that I think about as well. We have studies that actually looked at what happened when you give an amphibicarb, the 8.4%, and you give a, a, a bicarb isotonic infusion. What they found was that the isot- hypertonic and isotonic led to an increase in bicarb and pH, but it had no impact on potassium. <laughs> and another study, the biggest one I've been able to find by Gutierrez and all in 1991, Ooh. they did, the, they did a, a bicarb drip over two hours, and they compared that to uh, an amp, uh, 8.4% at one milligram per kilo over five minutes. What they found was this. Isotonic bicarbonate led to an increase in bicarb. Okay. Surprise. And it by 3%. And it actually did lead to a decrease in potassium by 0.3 uh, at, at three at three hours. At two hours, I'm sorry. But when looking at the hypertonic one, it led to a slight increase in bicarbonate and not only, but did not change the potassium levels. And I have some other studies that was back in 1977. God, I'm I'm serious about this beef here. <laughs> Back in 1977, they looked at stuff like this here, and they showed that it actually didn't do much but reduce the potassium by 0.15 for every one mill equipment and increase in bicarb. So I understand uh, the logic of all of this stuff here. Uh, but the best study, I think, of all the bicarb studies, and I like to put a caveat to all of my beef, was done in 1959 by Swartz and colleagues, and they did a Five percent sodium bicarb drip over two to six hours. Again, basically, they take it took your amp, diluted it slightly, uh, took your amp and diluted it slightly, but still gave it over a prolonged period of time. And what they found was that it had resolution of all EKG abnormalities in all their patients. Hmm. Two died in twenty four hours, but again, it did, it did a phenomenal <laughs> job of what I think the purpose of sodium bicarbonate is. And hyperkalemia, I think its only role as a push is to be pushed after you push calcium to stabilize that cardiac membrane by driving that increase in extracellular sodium to overcome the blockade in that NAV 1.5 channel. Rant so it's the sodium that's important, not yeah. the bicarb. All, so, the, all the love to the sodium, all the hate to the bicarb. <laughs> so, Jimmy. Are in your order panel or or when you're treating these hyperkalemic patients with EKG changes, do you guys routinely give the sodium bicarb for that reason? Like for the EKG changes yeah. routinely? Like and and do your providers know that? Or are they like, oh yeah, it's the HK ATP ace. That's why we're giving it. Most most of them don't. And this is the thing. In certain cases, they know that I hate it, 
So when I come and I'm, I'm involved with the case, it's always, it's, it's, it's very challenging to order in an order set by itself, by design. I'm mm-hmm. being honest. So it's, it's harder to order. It's not a pre-check item. And when you, and when you do, when it's given as an amp, I usually say I'm giving it in conjunction with the calcium. And you're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm fixing the EKG changes that, that had you call me. I can care less about using this particular agent for the potassium reduction. So I don't tell them usually until afterwards, but I, they've heard my rant over and over. And thank God, my, 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 both my ED teams are phenomenal. And they go and listen to these episodes. And I've had an attending like hold a resident back and say, what are you doing? He was like, I thought we should use bicarbonate. Like, just don't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> don't say it out loud. Jimmy's going to come over here and get you. So no, I don't, if, if I'm understanding this right, are you giving the calcium and then you're saying, let's start a bicarb infusion? Or are you just giving it right after the calcium pretty much as a rule with the EKG changes? Now, again, so it, it, I have two different ways. If I'm, if I'm using the bicarb as a, the 8.4% bolus, I'm on, for me personally, I'm only using that for EKG changes. Mm-hmm. If nephro comes down and they're insisting on a patient that's not necessarily ready for dialysis to, to and they have AKI and they want to use it to just ward off um, having to start dialysis, then I'll ask them to start an infusion. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. This is a trick here. Mm-hmm. This is a trick. When people oh, yeah. want to argue with me about the bicarb and whether they should give it as an amp or to give it as an infusion. If they don't necessarily, they want, they want it right now. What I do is this. If you put an amp of bicarbonate in a 250 bag of, of, dex, of, of D5, it usually, depending on your manufacturer, there should be anywhere from 20 to 30 mLs of overfill. So if I give one amp and I put it in there, I'm going to get close to 333 mLs, which is one third of a bicarb drip. So I've made a mini bag of an isotonic solution of sodium bicarbonate that I can run wide open if they want to. And I, I basically get what I want by not giving it as a, a super concentrated sodium bicarbonate load. And I can run it over, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, which is how all of this was studied in the first place. But we both get our way. They get bicarb. I give, <laughs> I give them what they need. And I, I actually make it to where I don't necessarily always have to give a, um, another amp of D50 as well. So that's a trick that I use sometimes. I'll say, okay, you want bicarb? You want you, you want the amp and you don't want the infusion? They say, well, he can't take the volume. I say, okay, how about 250? Oh, he can take 250. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, man. That is perfect. That is perfect. <laughs> Check out all of the beef with bicarb episodes. You will not be disappointed. You know, one day I got to have you back on here and we're, and we're just going to, we're just going to crap on bicarb in all of the settings and we're going to summarize this nicely for somebody um we, we got to do something like that because i, would, I, I think it. i think it's definitely needed uh, and i enjoyed it very much all right so we got to cigars and then you said there was a loop at the end was yes. it cigars loop yeah we loop all, all right. this up and that must be loop diuretics yeah so we got our loops there and i think this is the most underappreciated component of the entire uh therapy and we make sure we we add if your patient can pee make them pee if your patient can't pee make them poop and that's that's the way i think about our treatment <laughs> for for all of this um if again a, half of your patients should be able to urinate to some degree and even if they only make a small amount of urine my nephro colleagues has told me that they think that if a patient can make any urine give them a loop diuretic especially if if it can be any what uh, helpful. The problem with loop diuretics, and traditionally I'm using um, furosemide anywhere from 40 to 80 milligrams as my IV dose, and or if they're on a different agent at home, I'm using that agent and using, using the dosing that they traditionally use. Um, but the problem is I don't have a significant amount of data. I can't right. find much. I don't know if you can, but independently, I can't necessarily find the, re- the amount of potassium reduction all I know is that in some cardiac studies that use loop diuretics, they just report hypokalemia. Um, and great, but I don't have a, I personally don't have a, a, a amount. And traditionally, we should see this, we can, we can see a uh, diuresis occur within 30 minutes or so. But I don't necessarily have as strong data and recommendations, I would say, when it comes to our loop diuretics, other than it makes perfect sense to do so. And it's something that we probably should end up doing for patients that can urinate. 
Perfect. Perfect. I think that wraps up most of the drug treatments. I know we talked a lot about nephrologists, but we didn't really mention hemodialysis. You know, this is a pharmacy podcast. But typically, uh, Jimmy, I think of obviously hemodialysis would be the treatment of choice in patients who are already on hemodialysis or maybe even peritoneal dialysis or whatever, or have uh, severe CKD, um, who have maybe missed a couple sessions. Um, again, in consultation with a nephrologist, um, but we won't really get into the details uh, of that on this show for the sake of time. But is there anything else you want to add to obviously definitive treatment with hemodialysis in hyperkalemia? No, I think that the data kind of really plays into I, my personal data shows that those patients, you can do as much as you want from a drug standpoint, mm-hmm. but dialysis is just phenomenal. It is definitely the, the preferred treatment. If you can get them there soon, it does wonders for you. And the combination of all of those can drop your patient's potassium. Again, if they're really high in the sevens and eights, you can go down by three, three and a half milliequivalents. And um, that's just phenomenal. It's not nothing by itself or a drug combination can get you there. Exactly. And I don't want to, you know, uh, act like we forgot about this one. It's definitely one of the most, if not the most important treatments for hyperkalemia in this setting. And again, like Jimmy said, if there's some kind of delay to dialysis, you can try giving one of those cation exchangers to kind of buy you some time, um, which would be pretty much the only time we would use one of those cation exchangers. Yeah. And then to kind of wrap everything up, we touched on this a little bit. And I think it's really important that we end the show with talking about, you know, something maybe a little less exciting, order sets and order panels for these orders. At my site, we have an order set or an order panel for literally almost everything you can think of, which I'm a big fan of. Um, And especially in this setting, uh, in the setting of hyperkalemia, the ISMP put a very nice report out strongly recommending that clinical sites make a hyperkalemia treatment order set to reduce the risk of errors um, because a lot can go wrong, right? You can order the wrong calcium salt. You can order the wrong dose of insulin. You can order the wrong route of insulin. You can order uh, sodium bicarb as a bolus when you're working with Jimmy and get yelled at, right? So (laughs) do you, we have an order panel and it's very nice nowadays is, you know, these order sets and these order panels allow you to literally in real time teach the ordering provider what you're giving, why you're giving it. So we have specific parameters of when you would use this. It tells the nurses in every order what, um, um, how to administer the meds. For example, which is the first one we give, which one is the second drug, which one is the third drug, right? Assuming all of them are ordered. Um, so at my site, we have one gram of calcium gluconate. We have the insulin at, like I mentioned, 0.1 units per kilo with a max of 10 units. That is linked with an order for dextrose, depending again on their creatinine clearance and their initial blood glucose. So you either get 50 grams or 25 grams of dextrose. And then, like I said, we have that uh, scheduled order for dextrose every 30 minutes for hypoglycemia. And then we also do have the albuterol, 2.5 milligrams nebulized every five minutes for four doses. We have an order for furosemide. Uh, We do have Lokelma on there, and um, I'm going to have to delete this the instant I get back to work on Wednesday. But we we also have sodium bicarb injection and infusion, Jimmy. (laughs) So do you, I I know you mentioned that you guys also have an order set or order uh, panel is this kind of similar to what you guys use as well? Yeah, for the most part, all the same. I've been super fortunate in the last like year and a half. Um, I bounced back and forth between Grady and MUSC in a similar order sets across the board. My previous shop in Augusta, again, we had recently made the order set there as well and very similar wording, very similar material across the board. So I think um, for the most part, again, having an order set for hyperkalemia is key and it just really prevents a lot of the errors that occur because the problem that i have guys is that i think sometimes we get too excited and we don't focus on how simple it is to treat hyperkalemia but how easy it is to mess it up as well Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely it's something so simple but i have seen a good amount of errors that uh treatment panels and and order sets like this can hopefully help reduce jimmy was there anything else that you wanted to mention before we signed off in terms of 
treatment of hyperkalemia? Do you want to mention anything else about what you got going on? Anything like that? I think it's really just focusing on, again, orders of development is going to be going to be key uh, when it comes to hyperkalemia. And I think I, I should probably put this out here first. You, you got your audience will be the first to hear this, but we're going to be having the Form So Heart Tour this summer. Are right, we going to go to we're going to go to seven cities? Uh, we're going to go and we're going to we're going to shadow some people in their EDs. We're going to interview them. We're going to have a nice dinner and, and get together on on a, on a Friday night. And we're going to do something fun, whether it's cake ball, pool parties, all that great stuff. We're going to be doing those things as well on, on a Saturday. So I'm going to travel across. Um, I'm not going to get too far west, but we're going to go. We're going to travel around and just get to talk to different pharmacists, get to experience their EDs, their hospitals if available, and really get together. So I'm going to be putting the information out. But again, your audience is going to be the first to to hear this because I think that we are a community, a pretty fun community. And I think this is going to be one of the things that we can start to do to get ourselves together uh, and without having to go to a big conference and leap too far. So the Form So Heart Tour will, will, will be here. And I'm definitely inviting everyone in the Boston area, Chicago, Orlando, Atlanta, Dallas, and Denver to be my, my big spots uh, for this summer. So if you guys are listening and you're in that area or can get to that area, it's going to be amazing. That is awesome, man. You know, next year, you're going to have to add Minneapolis, St. Paul to that list. Oh, yeah. Got to. Be happy I'll to be, have I'll you. Get, I may get there this, this, this winter, man. That's just the summer. So we'll see how it goes. All right, man. Keep in touch. Well, all right, guys, there you have it. Thank you so much to Jimmy Pruitt. Check out his podcast, The Farm So Hard Podcast. Like I said, he's got some great episodes on there, uh, especially his beef with bicarb series. I love it. I think you're as obsessed with bicarb as I am with K-Centra and warfarin reversal and um, underdosing of status epilepticus meds. Oh. And it's just so refreshing to hear somebody who's obviously researched this um for a significant amount of time uh so thanks again man for coming on and sharing your knowledge uh, thanks for in inviting me and thanks for coming on my show and giving me the number one episode of farm so hard so oh man that is awesome that is super humbling man thanks again we'll have to do it again all right you got to promise me now you're going to come back you're going to talk about beef with bicarb in one episode and you're going to hit all three issues yeah you you can you can you have to shut me up talking about that man <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks man Thank you. Have a good day.